turn the program over to Renee. Um, we just put out a newsletter that Renee was gracious enough to provide a, um, an article about dealing with, with um, COVID-19. She writes a really, really wonderful and, and informative blog, um, was a caregiver for her husband and is also a physician. So if you talk about the whole package in terms of dementia education, you know, Renee's it. She's, she's lived it. She's walked the walk and talked the talk. And um, there's a lot that we can learn from her. So Renee, again, thank you so much for um, being here and sharing with us today. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just introduce myself first, uh, like you said. So I am Renee Harmon. I am a family physician, so I'm not a neurologist. I don't have the training that neurologists have, but I certainly know about Alzheimer's disease from a medical aspect, but more importantly, as a caregiver to my husband. So Harvey was my husband and we were actually in practice together. We shared a family medicine practice um, down 280. Um, we shared the responsibilities of caregiving our daughters as well, our child care with our daughters. Um, we would alternate days at the office and alternate days at home with the kids when they were young. And the plan was to increase our hours at the office as the children began to get older and could drive themselves. But um, that never happened because Harvey was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2010 at the age of 50 and he had to retire immediately upon that diagnosis. So I assumed full-time responsibility at our medical office and became the primary parent to our two teenage daughters and head of the household at home. Um, anyway, it, there was just, it was a lot all at once. Uh, he ended up being able to stay home alone for about four years with a lot of support from community. Um, we were very involved in our church and uh, that's where most of our support came from were from friends at church who did various things. My favorite story is my friend Nancy, I, I had this idea that um, I would hire a chef to come cook with Harvey and prepare meals advance, advance, in advance so I could pull them out. Um, but Nancy said, oh, you don't have to do that. I'll cook with Harvey. And uh, even though she would tell you, she would be the first to tell you she is no cook, but she would show up once a week with recipes. And she and Harvey would go to the grocery store, shop together, then come home and create this meal. Um, it gave him, number one, something positive to do and contribute to our family. And it gave him interaction with Nancy, who was yeah. great with him. And he cooked a meal, or they cooked a meal oh, wow. together. Then Nancy would stay, and I got to socialize with my friend Nancy. at the time. So that's just one example of the support we had while he was at home for those four years. Um, then there were two years where he had caregivers with him at home and that increased the number of hours that they were there. But, um, and finding the right caregivers was an ordeal like all, like all of y'all know. But we, you know, once we landed on these two women that were fabulous, that just slipped into our lives, things worked really, really well until it was time to place him in a memory care unit. And there again, it's another very difficult decision caregivers are sometimes forced to make. Um, and I, I can talk about that for a long time, but the two main reasons people put their family member into long-term care or memory care are incontinence and sleep issues. And that's basically what drove me to uh, make that decision. Um, it was the right decision. It, it was very hard, and um, but it was the right decision. And the, the main recognition I knew that this was the right thing was when I took Harvey to that memory care unit and the director there, Nicole, some of y'all know, remember Nicole um, at St. Martin's, said to me, it's gonna be fine, Renee. We are here to care for your husband so that you can love him. And that just freed up. I realized I had been caring for him in a 
loving way for the most part. But now I was free to just love him. And that took all most of the guilt away um, from me. So I'm coming at today's talk with kind of that perspective of the whole eight years that Harvey lived with this disease. Um, so I'd like, I'm doing a, um, a slideshow presentation or a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, like Miller said, she's going to record this and place it on uh, YouTube for later reference. There are some um, links that you can, I don't know how well that it'll work to just click on the link once it's in YouTube, but you can copy and paste or type it in yourself that I found to be helpful. Um, so are, if there are any questions about me and my experience, I can take those now before I launch into my um, discussion. How old, was he, how old was he when you put him in the uh, in memory care? How old was he? Uh -huh. He was, I guess, 56. And he passed away when he was 58. Okay. Was it difficult for him? At that point, he was so pro far progressed that he didn't really understand. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit hard. It, he was in three different memory care units and five different geriatric psych stays. It, it, it was difficult on us. And it was, you'd have to say it was difficult on him. I mean, medications, different people, you know. But we could, I could not have managed it at home, even with caregivers. It would have taken two caregivers 24 hours a day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I'll, I'll launch right in. Let's see. Here we go. When he was in the memory care unit, Mm -hmm. Did he, you said you had multiple experiences, uh, did he come back home and then no. back to the uh, another different memory care unit? No, it was all, um, he was in the memory care unit and then he would exhibit some behavior that, that sent him to a geriatric psych stay. And mm -hmm. then from there, the old memory care unit would sometimes say we can't take him back and then the geriatric psych unit their um, social worker would find a new place or we would find a new place for him mm -hmm. is how that worked okay thank you so i'm going to talk today about the stages of alzheimer's of how we stage alzheimer's disease and how that can be helpful or not so let's see we start by telling you a story. So in the summer of 2010, uh, it was going to be a typical summer, let's go look at colleges road trip. Um, with it was, it was my husband and myself and our oldest daughter, who was about to be a senior in high school. So Harvey had a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment at the time. And in, in two months, he would officially be diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. So I initially thought that Harvey and our daughter would go alone because I needed to stay at the office and keep our medical office going. But I eventually thought the better of that and decided that I should go on this trip too. So this trip was going to be one of our typical family trips. Harvey would drive, I would navigate. I, always navigate uh, because I love maps and I always have loved maps. Um, in fact, I just got back from a trip up by myself up to North Carolina in the mountains and I took nine maps with me and I used them all as well as the GPS. But anyway, on this trip, I uh, pulled out all my maps and figured out the route that we would need to take to hit three colleges in the Southeast. I figured out the route and where we would need to stop to spend the night. And I knew I had a glove compartment full of maps and I had my memory and my instinct to get us there. And I and we took um, a GPS with us. So this was 2010 and none of us had smartphones yet, but we had one of those 
um, Tom Tom GPSs, if you remember that, so you would plug into the uh, cigarette lighter. So we had the Tom Tom, and that would be my backup. So the first stop was Nashville. And as we closed in on the city limits, I opened the glove box to get the map of Tennessee out because I needed to see which exit to take to get to the college exactly. There were no glove, no maps in the glove compartment. We had taken my husband's car and he does not share, he did not share my love of maps. So I had no maps. So we plugged in the Tom Tom and that got us to the college without much problems. The next step was to go, we were going to go east on I-40 and I used the TomTom Tom GPS to get us onto I-40 and my, I remembered my plan was to travel east through Knoxville and then pick some small town in East Tennessee to stop and spend the night. No problem. The next morning I plugged in the second college destination and the GPS told me it was going to be 12 hours. Well, that is not what I had planned. It was supposed to be six hours. That was my original route. I had no map and now I couldn't trust the GPS. I was just going to go on my memory and my instinct. So we kept going on what I thought was the right route. But as soon as we crossed into North Carolina, I made Harvey pull over at the welcome station so I could get a map. And it was like a drug. I opened that map on my lap and all my anxiety just melted away. So now with this map in my lap, I could see exactly where we were. I could see where we were going. I could see each of the individual little towns that we were gonna pass through. And this map even had mileages between each of the towns. So I could add those up, do the calculations, and I realized it's really six hours like I thought it was. So I used this map. We got to that second college, no problems. The third college was the trip there was going to require multiple interstate changes, right? So I had the map in my lap. I had the signs above me on the road that would tell me which lane to be in. And I thought that this is going to be fine. So I, I, I found, however, that Harvey could not respond to my directions quickly enough. So it ended up being very tense. So I, for example, I would say, okay, you need to get in the left lane. No, no, left, not right, left. No, no, this way. And okay, now we need to turn. No, not now. Now, no, no, now, 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 now turn, turn, turn now. And it was just, I was, it was me barking out orders and Harvey getting frustrated because I'm screaming at him and our daughter's in the back seat, probably wondering what the heck is going on, but we made it and it was fine. And the only other thing about this trip was coming home. We had to um, drive through Atlanta it was late, late, late at night, so there was no traffic, but it began to rain really hard. And I really wanted to go to sleep because it was so late. I was so tired, um, but I thought that I really should drive. But Harvey would have none of it. He said he was fine. He would keep driving. But I noticed that his speed would change dramatically. It would go from 30 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour, and I was just terrified that we were going to run up against somebody or that somebody would run into the back of us with his driving like that. So I forced myself to stay awake and monitor his driving and monitor the cars around us. And it was fine. We made it home. And at the end of that trip, um, my daughter said that she was really glad that I had come with me. She realized that she and her dad alone could not have done that trip together. And uh, it was, you know, a few, a couple of years later, I realized that trip, that experience was what it felt like for me and for Harvey and our whole family with this Alzheimer's thing. It felt like we were dropped into the middle of Alzheimer's world without a map, without a guidebook or a signs. I wanted somebody to, to say, you are here. And in two years, you're going to be here. 
but nobody could do that for us. And in fact, all the physicians would say is everybody's different. Everybody's course is going to be different. We can't tell you. And I get that. I understand, I understand that that's true, but it still felt like I was navigating without a rudder and not knowing where I, what I was doing. I ended up kind of creating a map for myself as we went along. Um, and by that I meant um, I learned to trust my love for my husband and my instincts for caregiving and, that, and to see how he responded. And if he didn't respond really well like the way I thought he would, then I would change tactics and try something else. I relied on my close friends and family to tell me when I got off the path. It was usually when I would get distracted with something that felt more important to me at the time and they could tell me, uh, no, 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 that's, you're off on a tangent, get, get back to where you need to be. Um, and I journaled. Uh, so journaling was a way for me to write out my um, emotion, it, my emotional experience, what was going on with me. But I also started to write down what was happening to Harvey. And I created a map, not to use at the time. It was better like looking back saying, oh yeah, that that is how this has progressed. And I ended up using that map, that journal to write um, my memoir. So I, I have written a memoir that um, should be published in the, the end of August, beginning of, of um, September. So looking forward to that. Eventually, I came to realize that the Alzheimer's stages is the best we can do for a map, right? It, it gives us a common language to talk about uh, when we're talking to friends and family and physicians. There's a world of difference from saying that um, my loved one has the early stages of Alzheimer's versus my loved one is in the end stages of Alzheimer's. So it gives us a common language that kind of uh, tells each other where they are in the disease. By knowing what stage your loved one is in, it also helps us understand what our loved one's limits are, what they can and cannot do, what we can and cannot expect them to be able to do. And therefore it guides us into making care decisions more appropriately. Something that might be work really well when somebody's early on, it's not gonna work well in the middle stages necessarily. So there are some difficulties with this. As I was doing my research on, on staging, there are multiple staging systems and, that, and that's just confusing. And we're gonna go through them and you'll see. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages on each of these staging systems. And we'll look at that. Um, all of the staging systems, especially the last one that I'm gonna talk about, assume that the patient is not on any medication. So they are mapping the natural progression of the disease, right? So there, it might be different for your loved one for that reason. And just like the neurologists told me, every patient is unique and progresses differently. Our brains are so unique to ourselves that there, there is, and when that brain is broken, like it is in Alzheimer's disease, there is no way that each person who is suffering with Alzheimer's disease is going to progress down the path the same way. Her brain is different from his brain, is different from her brain, is different from my brain, and they're going to progress at their own rate. Other disease states make the progression different too. So um, say if someone has heart disease, they're gonna be ill with that, and so therefore that might um, in, increase the severity of the disease quicker. 
So we'll first look at the most simple staging. This is, I call the three simple stages. I found this at um, Alzheimer's Association. And this is what most people are familiar with when you're just talking. Um, but to make it even more confusing, of course, they have to have two different names. So you can call it early stage, middle stage, late stage, but that's also the same thing as mild, moderate, and severe. And it, you know, that makes sense, but it's um, you know, just one more thing to make it more complicated. So let's go through those. Um, and this, is, this information, again, is from the Alzheimer's Association. So early stage or mild Alzheimer's disease, the underlying statement I can say about that is most are able to function at home independently. They might need some help with more um, complicated tasks, maybe financially or um, planning a dinner party, but for the most part, they can function at home independently. They can drive, they can work, they can go to parties. Um, they might lose things and misplace things. It's harder for them at this stage to learn something new, like Zoom meetings and <laughs> other things on the computer. Um, they can have trouble planning and organizing. So that's what I meant about a, a dinner party or something more complicated than that. So the patient themselves knows that something's going on with their cognition. They know it. They know they have memory lapses. Close family and friends can notice it as well. And a physician doing a mini mental status exam can detect that can detect losses on that screening exam at this point. Not just in conversation. So if somebody came to me in my office and we're talking, I wouldn't be able to, I probably wouldn't be able to pick up on anything. So a physician at this point really relies on the family member to say something's going on. And, and then I would, I would listen and gather my information. Uh, from the patient, from the family, and then do the workup, including a mini mental status exam. But um, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to go into this right now, but the basic, I, I will, I, th I think it's important information. So a basic workup when somebody presents to either primary care physician or neurologist. Now, some primary care physicians will do this. Some don't feel comfortable and would refer immediately to neurology. But the initial workup would be obtaining a complete history from the patient and the family, um, a physical. Then there's lab work, and this is mainly to rule out other reasons for dementia to rule out things like a vitamin B12 deficiency or a low functioning thyroid. So there's a battery of tests we do. And then you also order an MRI or a CAT scan, looking again, mainly looking for things that could be causing the problem, looking for a brain tumor or strokes might show up. And then after, after all of that is done, and you would also do a mini mental status exam um, you wait a period of time and repeat the mini mental status exam to see if there's been any change, any decline. And you can really only diagnose Alzheimer's disease when you see, when the physician documents a change in cognition. So that's it in a nutshell. And there are other memory tests that physicians do besides just the mini mental status exam. Um, um, there, there are other ones that work too. But let's, let's move on. Um, so middle stage, the overarching theme here is patients need help with daily activities, right? They really should not be living independently when they are in middle stage Alzheimer's disease. Um, that's mainly help with cooking, helping choose the appropriate clothing. That's here. Um, language becomes more difficult. Um, finding the right word, 
saying the right word, confusing words, and trouble expressing themselves because they can't find the right words. This, is, this stage is where um, becoming lost and wandering happens. They really shouldn't be driving in, when they're in the middle stage because of that. Sleep becomes disrupted. And the main behavioral issues here are uh, frustration, anger, paranoia. And that's because when you don't understand what's going on in your world, you, you, it's very frustrating and you can lash out because you don't understand what's going on. You also, they will also kind of create a reality that makes sense to them when their world doesn't make sense with the facts that they've, that they, that they can process, they create a world that makes better sense. So it makes better sense to them that you stole their watch rather than they put their watch in their shoe under the refrigerator, right? So that's kind of where the uh, suspicious and delusions come in. Um, so late stage, the underlying theme here is they're going to need around the clock care for daily activities. They need help with dressing and bathing and uh, meal prep. Um, and it, as it continues, uh, they cannot carry on conversation at all. They ha might have words and eventually will lose, but they cannot have a meaningful conver conversation. They be become unaware of their surroundings and um, in the very last part of this, they lose the ability to walk, to sit, and eventually to swallow. So that's kind of the three stages in, in a nutshell. And we'll delve a little bit deeper on some of these other staging systems. So then I found this five stage system and it was kind of exciting, except they added two stages at the beginning. So <laughs> these aren't really Alzheimer's disease. So they added preclinical Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. And this is from Mayo Clinic's website. Preclinical Alzheimer's disease is the patient has no symptoms whatsoever, but if you do a PET scan, you can see abnormal deposits of amyloid, the, the plaques and tangles, but they have no symptoms. So this is gonna be important in the future, or maybe even now, while we're looking for drugs to treat Alzheimer's disease, if we can identify patients at this stage when there's abnormality already being seen, maybe medications can keep them in this preclinical phase or slow it down long enough that they're in this preclinical phase for a very long time. Right now, we know patients are actually in this preclinical phase for years even decades. So if we had done a PET scan on Harvey, say when he was 40, it probably would have shown some abnormalities. So the flip side of that is, do you wanna know? Um, and so I assume that they're going to design clinical studies and you wouldn't be told that you had preclinical, you would just assume you were in the normal group. Um, Anyway, you see what I'm getting at. It's, this is gonna be a way, hopefully, that we can develop some treatment that uh, can target patients early before they have any symptoms. So after preclinical comes mild cognitive impairment. And that's just exactly what it sounds like. It's a description. Um, so it's, the patient is aware their memory's not as good as it should be and the people closest to them know something's off, but it doesn't impact their daily life at all. So this is what Harvey was first diagnosed with. When I first knew something was going on, um, it was actually on a trip, on a big vacation, and we had a guide who would tell us what we were doing, what we needed to wear, what time we needed to be somewhere, and he just could not keep track of that. Um, and I, I knew something was off because this man is brilliant. 
Um, and I eventually got him to a neurologist who diagnosed him with mild cognitive impairment, right? So that was April. And then by September, he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It had progressed to that point. And so most people do go on to develop Alzheimer's disease, um, but some do not. Um, actually, some people stay at this mild cognitive impairment for years. Uh, I have a friend um, in California whose husband has been in mild cognitive impairment for 10 years plus. Um, so it, it, it's interesting. And, and this is really hard to document as a physician. Uh, they would score normal on a mini mental status exam. So it's, it's hard. All right, then I found this seven stage system. So here, this is from WebMD. And if you go in and just Google the stages of Alzheimer's disease, you'll see a lot of information about the seven stages of Alzheimer's. So this one, they broke moderate into two different parts and they broke severe into two different sections. And it was just a way of clumping it. So moderate Alzheimer's disease in the three stage system is actually very long and there's a lot of symptoms that are going on at that time. So this just breaks it out, adding moderately severe. Um, this is where the wandering and the confusion about where they are, and what time it is, is because that's later in the moderate stage and the repeating questions is more prominent here. Um, very severe breaks out of those last stages when they are losing the ability, their muscle ability, their inability to feed themselves, inability to walk and sit up independently. So that's the very severe. I'm just breaking that out. All right. Then I found this. Actually, I didn't find this. A good friend of mine found it, printed it off, and gave it to me. And I really encourage everyone, and I share this all the time, this bottom link at Alzheimer's Info. This global deterioration scale was developed by Dr. Ger Barry Reisberg. He's a geriatric psychiatrist. And he developed this scale for clinicians. So it's really used by professionals and professional caregivers to stage a patient, to have a common language with the other caregivers to know exactly where a patient is. I just find it helpful as a caregiver um, on multiple levels, and I'll, I'll explain that. So you have the seven stages. Theirs are a little different. He added at the beginning, he, he added normal, normal aging, um, mild cognitive impairment, and then level four or stage four is mild Alzheimer's disease. So it'll, it, again, yet another way to stage Alzheimer's disease. And we'll go, we'll go through um, stage four, five, six, and seven. Um, let's see. Interesting thing about this scale, you, it gives a length of time in each, in each stage, and I found that really helpful. Although, it, again, nothing's carved in stone, every patient is different, blah, blah. Uh, it also gave um, a mental age equivalent, and this was helpful to me to know how best to approach my husband. If he was had the mental equivalent of a five-year-old, I'm not going to lecture him with big words and long sentences. I'm going to target what I need to say simply. Um, not that we need to treat our loved ones like children. They are still adults, but you need to meet them where they are, right? Um, again, oh, I, I missed this point. There are substages, so you'll see as we get along in stage six and seven, uh, moderately severe and severe, they break them down in substages, and we'll go through that. Um, and again, like I said, this assumes a, the normal scan, span of Alzheimer's disease. It's normal progression without any medications. So some of these time frames seem off to me because of that. But anyway, we'll go through. So 
on this global deterioration scale, um, mild Alzheimer's disease. Another thing I liked about this article is they list a lot more symptoms than these other scales do. It was really helpful for me to see other behaviors and, and activities listed. So I mentioned before finances and dinner parties. They mention that specifically here. Poor memory for recent events. That's things like, um, who do you remember who we saw at Thanksgiving last week? Um, do you remember uh, who visited last, things like that, recent, recent events. They commonly make mistakes in what day of the week it is, season and month. And the behavior here, they, and no one mentioned it in the other scales, is denial and withdrawal. So in mild Alzheimer's disease, a lot of patients shield themselves, shield their emotional well-being by denial, right? Um, it's a mechanism, it's a defense mechanism to shield themselves from admitting there's something wrong. They can also withdraw. And again, that is because they know that they're not where they should be. So they'd rather not put themselves out there. So they back off and withdraw from society. And Harvey did both of these a lot in an he would back off and let me kind of be the spokesperson for him. And, and denial was definitely part of what was going on. He would tell me that he was fine and I'm not gonna get any worse, things like that. So this scale says this lasts about two years and that's about it for us. Um, and that the middle age is eight to 12. And that, that seems about right to me. You really can't tell much. You know, a 12 year old's pretty um, uh, verbal and um, uh, there's a word I'm trying to think of, huh. but let's see, let's move on. So moderate Alzheimer's disease on this global deterioration skill, again, says they should not be living independently. We already went over that difficulty choosing correct clothing. And that means looking outside and knowing that it's winter, but they put on summer clothes. More often the other way, it's summer hot as can be, but they're layering up with all kinds of sweaters and coats, right? They can still put on their clothes. They just have difficulty with the right choices. Um, they also have a hard time shopping for the right food and preparing that food. So if left to their own devices, if they're independent, if they're trying to be independent at home alone, they'll eat crackers and cookies and maybe heat up soup if they, if they can do that. They cannot manage their finances. Somebody really needs to be overseeing that at this point. Um, they have loose recall of current life. So that means it comes and goes, right? So their address, sometimes they can say it, sometimes they can't. Um, they have a hard time with what year it is and what schools they went to in the past. And the behavior he, at this stage is, can be anger and suspiciousness. And kind of, we went over that before. Again, they are having a hard time grasping their reality so they end up acting out in anger and frustration or suspiciousness. And this scale puts it at approximately one and a half years and a mental age of five to seven. Okay. Moderately severe. This is when they start using the sub stages. So, um, you can see it breaks it down and on, um, how much assistance they need with activities of daily living. And it goes in order. And um, they pretty much, first they lose the, difficult, lose the ability to put on their clothes appropriately without assistance. So I know that um, Harvey would have difficulty putting on his clothes. I found him one day putting on a sweatshirt by putting his legs in each of the arms. Um, so they just need help. And you can't just leave the clothes out and expect them to put on, on. They'll put them on in the order that they're stacked. So I learned to like put his underwear on top of his pants and then put 
a shirt and then a sweater in that order so that he would put them on in the correct order. So it may not need overt assistance at the beginning, but there are ways that you can help. And eventually they need you to dress them completely. Then they develop the need to help with bathing and brushing teeth. And initially that's going to be setting the water temperature. That's usually first thing that they need help with. And then just the mechanics of bathing. I would like soap up a washcloth and give it to him, get him started. And then he could, reflexes would just take over. Same thing with brushing teeth. I could, I would put the toothpaste on, put it in his mouth, he would take over. Then comes toileting issues and toileting correctly means they have an urge, they know they're supposed to go, but they don't necessarily go in the right place. They might put the toilet paper in a wrong place, like in the trash can. They may not flush. It's just not done correctly. Then urinary incontinence develops Then fecal incontinence develops. This is the stage where they can't, they don't recognize close family members. And the behavior here is fidgeting and pacing and moving things around. This is because they can't, they cannot figure out what to do with themselves. They're lost. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't have a routine anymore. So they pace and kind of create things to do. And the, the outburst can become more violent at this point as they lose the ability to, they also lose the ability to monitor their emotions and to modulate their emotions. There's very limited meaningful speech at this stage. You cannot have a meaningful conversation. There are words, but there's no back and forth. There's no conversation. Severe Alzheimer's disease, in this scale, they don't break it apart between severe and very severe, but it it shows that. And again, they state that they require continuous care with daily activities. But they break it down in 7A that speech is limited to six or fewer words, um, and then just one word, and then difficulty walking, sitting. They've got smiling here, I would add, um, feeding the self, feeding self about in there too, and then inability to hold up their head. So, and that does progress just pretty much in that way. They also make a point of um, talking about the uh, physical changes that are happening. If a patient cannot move, they're going to develop rigid joints um, and contractures means the, um, the joint, the muscles contract up. So you may have seen somebody like this, <laughs> um, and that, that's a contracture where the um, muscles have drawn in because they're not being able to use all of their muscles in their joints. Now, I'll, I'm going to leave this up because when you add all these up, they're saying that this severe Alzheimer's disease lasts what, one, two, three, four, five, six years. Plus, so look at this last stage, seven, eight, can last indefinitely. Right. This is assuming that a patient has no underlying medical conditions and gets no complications of Alzheimer's disease. A person can die of Alzheimer's disease if it progresses along its normal path and they get really good care. It can last whatever, whatever we decided that was, six, seven, eight years at this stage. But that's really uncommon, really, right? So most patients are going to be older and they're going to have a multitude of medical problems that are going to complicate things and cause them to pass away before this whole eight year thing can happen. Um, or they're going to get a complication. And the most common complication is pneumonia um, or other infections. Um, Head trauma from a fall is another common complication that results in, in the end of life. Um, that 
is the end of my presentation. I wanted to end with this to kind of illustrate the, the Harvey on the left is in moderately severe Alzheimer's. He's at respite care with CARES and he is, I know something's wrong here, but you guys probably don't see anything. He's a happy, smiling kid, but to me, he looks about five years old. He's, he, he's just kind of giggly and silly, and that is not who he was as a, as a grown man. I love it. I love this picture. He loved CARES, and he loved playing balloon volleyball at CARES, and that's who that man is on the left. The man on the right has very severe Alzheimer's disease. He's in a wheelchair. That's our older daughter with him, the one that went on our college trip. She's there to feed him because he can't feed himself. You can see he's having posture difficulties there sitting upright. This is, this is very severe Alzheimer's disease. I think he passed away about two months after this picture showed of complications from aspiration pneumonia. So that's it. That's my um, presentation. And I would certainly entertain any um, questions. Uh, one, one point I meant to say, this um, global deterioration scale, um, lots of different groups use this. If you Google it, you'll see, I saw where um, like nursing homes and respite care facilities use this and then say like what kind of activities would be appropriate in each of the levels. So like the, an activities director could use this scale and people's other uh, researchers work to say what kind of skills would be appropriate. So it, it's used very commonly for professionals um, to figure out appropriate care, appropriate activities. But I just find it helpful. I found it helpful as a caregiver because there was just so many different um, skills listed and it, it was, it gave me a map. It, it let me know where we were and how long it was gonna take to go from here to here. So, so I'm gonna turn this off and I can turn it back on when we need to, if we need to. Renee, I've got a, I've got a question. It's more like an observation that, that I hear a lot of people allude to, but doesn't really ever turn up on those kinds of scales. Mm -hmm. And that is when uh, the person with dementia becomes very self-absorbed. You know, they're, they're, it's all about them. You know, their needs are very immediate. They don't, they don't put their loved ones first anymore or their spouse right. first. Does that make you Understand. It does, doesn't it? Especially if you think about it with the mental age equivalent. Mm -hmm. You know, what five-year-old thinks of their parents? Right. You know, right. They're, they're so limited at a certain point in their world. Their world is much smaller than our world. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, I couldn't tell you kind of when that shows up. Would you have an idea, Miller, when you, when people? Well, to... I mean, I mean, I think that, I think that begins to happen in a, in a more moderate, I think that's a, that's an earlier, an kind earlier. Of symptom, you know, at least for, for some families, that's very frustrating for, uh, for caregivers who are, um, who've been in a very loving relationship and that's not, you know, that's just one more, one more loss. Yeah, absolutely. In the, in the picture on the right, did he still know his daughter? No, sir. Okay. I'm not sure he knew me even then. So I think we said that shows up in moderately severe where they don't recognize loved ones. You know, he recognized me as his person for a long, long time. He didn't know my name. He didn't know our relationship, but I was his person for a long, long, long time. It was probably just the last several months that I don't, I didn't get any feeling that he knew who I was, yeah. but he lost knowing who our daughters were before he lost knowing who I was. It hurts. It's so hard. Miller, will we have uh, access to these stages in a printed form? Can you print them out or make pictures of the screen that she had? 
Renee, what, what, can you make those available to us, your slides? Sure. I'll, I'll send you the PowerPoint presentation, Miller. Okay. And you can print them out. Um, and it'll include the, um, the links to those different uh, websites that I used. Will that be helpful? I'll scan them and send them to you, Laurie. I can email them. Yes, I just couldn't write fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, yeah, that's like a lot of, a lot of information. It was. And, and, we're, and we're, like I said, we're still kind of trying to figure all this out. So some of you, I know, and I have your email addresses, but not not everybody that, that's on here, because I'm not, so anyways, but I will send out to, to who I can. If it's something that you want and don't get from us, be sure to contact and we'll we'll get it out to you. Okay. But I've, I've got you, Laurie, I can find you. Okay, good. Well, this is gonna be- That was very, page. very helpful, by the way. Uh -huh. Thank you. It, it really was. I, I haven't seen anything that was quite this specific with age equivalents as yeah. well as length of time expectations. Mm -hmm. so. well, I should say this too. Oftentimes a patient will straddle um, stages. They might have some symptoms in one stage and some symptoms in another until they move all the way over. That's not yeah. uncommon. I'm, I'm seeing that. Yeah. And Renee, make, comment on um, how variable they can be sort of from day to day sometimes, you know? Uh, absolutely. And I, the best way I saw that I could, I could see hints of what was coming. So that's kind of how I looked at it. Like th there would be something weird. I, gosh, what is this? And then it would go away only to creep back in later. So it's kind of like a preview of what's coming. And yes, in good and bad days, sundowning is going to cause a lot of fluctuation. Uh, then too. Well, and Renee, it's Vance. W with with my mother, uh, she had nothing wrong with her physically, other than Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are listening to this, in that particular with my mother's scenario, every single one through the global deterioration, it, she hit all that. Her, she wasn't eating crackers; she was eating one particular brand and flavor of ice cream for quite a long period of time. <laughs> and bless her. And, and it just, everything fit. All of that, the final stages that we, that added up to six and a half years or six years. Wow. I saw, I, my mother, I would say that what we just saw in the deterioration, that added up to six years. My mother didn't have, have that late phase for that long, but she did all of those things, mm -hmm. um, memory care into to skilled care. So all of that basically makes perfect sense. Or, mm -hmm. And if you're wondering if this is how you, what, what to expect with your loved one, yeah. Pretty much, that's what you had. That's what I had, and, and that's the that's the tough reality of, of this disease. So, but it's it's it's. I love the adding of the, the age of the person, and what with the mental yeah. age, because um, that might help with the. Okay, let me calm down because I'm talking to a five year old. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, if you can calm down when you're talking to a five year old. <laughs> uh, Renee, does the early Alzheimer's diagnosis? accelerate the speed of the progression of the disease, would you say, or not? It just happens so, sooner. If a person knows they have it? No, no. no if, if, if with the diagnosis of early Alzheimer's, which is was in your 50s for your husband, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Does, does that accelerate the progression of the Alzheimer's disease? more rapidly because it's early onset than if it's just in your 70s or, or whatever. Right, that's a good question. So um, yes, there's some thought that if you develop it early, like he did, then it's gonna be a more aggressive form. Right. On the other hand, he was so healthy, otherwise he had no other health issues, maybe it, maybe he could last longer. In the end, right. it was eight years, which is the average anyway. So, yeah. Okay. One balances out the other. <clears throat> it did for us, yeah. And, and one more question, Renee, and this is, this is personal, I don't, I don't, but, you know, in, was, he, um, was he initially aware of his symptoms? Was this something that you, that you could discuss with him, that you could make plans with him? 
or were you alone and having to figure everything out? So I, I talked about the trip to Costa Rica when I first knew there was something going on, but he had actually been saying for a year or two before that he thought there was something wrong with his memory and I blew him off. I mean, I thought it was just middle age, um, bad on me. And that, that's why he bought those, he bought some brain training games to help see if that would help. Um, so bad on me. Um, unfortunately uh he went into denial and we just couldn't talk about it talk so about it. for yeah. us it was all on me mm -hmm. so. well thank you very much you're, you're very welcome thank you very good. good very good does anybody else have a question or a comment Will the presentation she did this morning be available? On yes, YouTube? we're going to put, we'll, we'll have a link to it and we'll put it on our website. Sherry is, um, and Sherry's up there in the corner, very dark. Sherry, you need some light on girl. Um, she the lights behind her. The lights behind her. She is, does a little bit of editing just to take out the, I don't know, the, the, the chitter chatter at the beginning, for example, but, but yeah, Sherry, and we'll get it up there. Um, Cause I, I think it's important information. A lot of people would be interested in, even if they weren't um, able to join us today. So uh -huh. good. All right. Well now on Tuesday at, um, at 11 o'clock, we are going to do a session on um, the, the, COVID response in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And this has been a big issue, Trish. I know you're, if you're still yes. on with us, it's been a real issue for you. And, and have you been able to see your mom yet? Only to take her to uh, two doctor's appointments. That, and they were deemed essential. And that's the only opportunity I've had to put my eyes on her. Well, I hope you found her to be well during those two visits. I don't. I, I did. Yeah. Well, that's that is good at least. But um, yeah, I think we're going to hear from Nick Beckham, who is our junior board president, and he works for Northport Health Services. Um, that's one of the largest nursing home chains in Alabama, and Nick has been on the front line of their uh, COVID nineteen response. And then Avon and Vance, I'm forgetting her last name. Oh, Tenario. Thank you so much. Um, and she is with the assisted living industry and has that same kind of depth of knowledge of, you know, really what it's been like in the trenches for them um, and what they see going forward. Because, you know, even though I think the Department of Health is now saying folks can have visitors, facilities are still not comfortable letting visitors and family come in. So um, it's been a real challenging time for people with loved ones in facilities. For sure. All right. Well, any other questions, comments? Renee, thank you so much for oh, sharing, you. you know, your, your professional well. knowledge, but also your personal story. It really does um, help bring the information to, to life for us. And um, it's just, you know, you've just got a great, great perspective and a lot of wisdom. So thank you for sharing. And I will, on the, the, the email tomorrow, put a link to, uh, to Renee's blog, because it's something y'all ought to all be getting. Um, do you put that out weekly, Renee? It is. It's weekly. Um, there's usually a link on my Facebook page, but you can sign up to get the blog sent to you. Too. Yeah. And this, actually, this is where this talk came from. Miller, you told me that um, you liked my blog about the stages. Yeah, the stages. So. Because it's a question people ask a lot. We get that question a lot, don't yeah. we, Vance? My loved one's doing this. What stage are they in? And um, so, and I'm I'm guilty of using that simple oh. early, middle, late. That that's that's been my go-to for years. But it it does help to see it more broken down with more detail. So, anyways, well, good everybody. Thank y'all so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Renee, like I said, we're very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. See you next time.